Welcome, everyone. My name is Sarah Schweig. I'm with CSU Extension here in Broomfield. Um, this class, if you couldn't tell by the um, background I'm donning this evening, is residential lawn care. So this is um, the last class um, for this season of the Broomfield Green Calendar. Um, some housekeeping notes. If you are on Zoom, please add any questions you may have in the Q&A. You might wanna wait until um, I've gotten through the presentation to see if they get answered, but totally up to you. And I will um, go through questions at the end and um, answer them then. And I'll also try to uh, check Facebook comments as well if you're there. Um, you can interact with the live Q&A on the Zoom or go ahead and um, put your comments in Facebook. So let's get started. I'm gonna just pop off my video so everyone can focus on the presentation and I will come back. So thinking about um, lawn care, there are a few kind of big buckets of cultural practices and um, maintenance that you want to know how to do. You know, some things are a little um, optional, but really these guys are not optional for healthy lawns. And then we will go over some common problems. Part of what we do at CSU Extension is um, answer questions about plants, including lawns, do diagnostics on plants, including lawns, and so I'm pulling out some of the common questions that we get, but as you'll see, um, as we kind of get through the presentation, really these cultural practices that we'll go over first um, are most of what we can do to prevent um, the most common problems. So first let's have a little background. Um, Broomfield, long story short, we know we're higher than your average, we are sunnier than your average, we're drier than your average. So looking at the average rainfall for the US, um, 37 inches a year for Broomfield, we're less than half. Um, average sunny days a year, um, we've got more than your average. And snowfall, we have more than the US on average, which isn't surprising, but we'll learn there are a couple um, specific lawn issues that that snowfall and specifically when we have kind of snow cover for any extended amount of time, um, it can contribute to some specific lawn issues that we get quite a bit. So I want to do a little bit of turf structure, nothing too, um, not too deep of a dive, but I want to briefly mention a couple of pieces because I'll refer to them as we kind of go along in the presentation. So just to get us all on the same page. So um, the major pieces I'd like to show you guys. Um, so the leaf, um, AKA blade, there are various, you know, um, actively growing components around it, but the crown actually kind of at the base is the part of the um, grass leaf or blade that, or of the grass plant, excuse me, that is going to determine its survival. So there are some um, diseases, for example, that can make the whole above ground green part of the grass look totally dead, but they don't kill the crown and that grass will come back. The crown is an important one. And then looking at stolons and rhizomes. So your sod forming grasses, um, like Kentucky bluegrass, it's commonly, uh, sold in sod form. They spread underground by rhizomes that would, gives them that nice um, mat-like coverage. Or the really aggressive spreaders, like a buffalo grass, for example, those spread by stolons. And um, they'll definitely form a sod for sure, but you might tend to see those types of grasses sold in plugs because they will um, just jump right out and start spreading through those stolons. Another kind of foundational piece before we get into the maintenance practices is thinking about how plants use or lose uh, water. So we call this evapotranspiration. So it's a combination of evaporation, um, which we all know, and then transpiration is 
the movement of water up through the plant. And they're related because if we have more evaporation, that's upward movement and that's going to draw more water um, up from the ground through the plant. Um, so it can be a good thing, but also um, there are, we need plenty of water supply if we've got lots of evapotranspiration. So um, there are various factors that can contribute to the rate of evapotranspiration, or you'll see it called ET, abbreviated, um, temperature. So if we have warmer temperatures, we have um, increased ET rate, more um, sun, basically. So full sun is going to have a higher ET rate than um, a cloudy day. Wind is going to, higher wind is going to increase the ET rate. And that's because, again, the evaporation, the um, water evaporating from the plant will increase, therefore moving more water up. And kind of similarly, that relative humidity, if there is greater relative humidity, um, the evapotranspiration rate is going to be um, lower. So now getting into the nitty gritty. Irrigation, one of the most important um, practices we um, take part in for our lawns and one that I think is on a lot of people's minds right now with this weather is just trying to uh, give our poor lawns enough water. Um, question we get a lot and the theme of this presentation is going to be it depends, but um, I'll try to provide some kind of rules of thumbs. Um, we get a lot of when do I water? So it's going to depend on um, various environmental conditions, um, the kind of um, texture and other factors of your soil and the type of grass and all these other cultural practices that will go over. But nonetheless, you can always say this as a correct answer. Water when you see signs of drought stress. You can develop an automatic schedule for um, your irrigation, um, but that is going to need to be honed in and that's really got to be done by just observation. And even once you hone it in, you'll need to adjust for season and precipitation. But really the most efficient way to water, um, though a little bit of a pain, is to um, water manually meaning to not water until you see these signs of drought stress because lawn will recover from these. So first uh, type of sign, kind of light drought stress, footprinting, which we see in the top right, um, or some blue-green discoloration that lasts into the afternoon. So basically, um, the grass doesn't spring right back after you um, walk on it. So this would be um, if you're keeping a close eye, this would probably be as far as you let it get, then you say, okay, it's time to water. Now, scorching or browning, um, that's when, you know, it's been a little too long since the last time you watered. Um, another measure for this is if you have a flathead screwdriver, try to stick it into the ground if it is difficult to do. It's probably been too much time since the last irrigation. So um, let's say you had a uh, footprinting one day, maybe you didn't catch it. Anytime in the next, you know, one to two days, depending on the weather, you're gonna wanna water. But if you see that scorching or browning um, on the third day, you know, you definitely wanna water before that. And then lastly is dormancy. So the lawn looks dead. Um, and usually it's not, it's just dormant. And we can look at some examples. So on the left, again, the footprint, you see the same kind of thing with um, mower lines, right? Um, we like those nice, pretty green lines, but when you have kind of brown or yellow lines behind your mower, time to water. Um, 
then drought seeing some more kind of distinct um, browning, yellowing and bigger patches, not just where you put that pressure, that's in the middle. And then dormancy on the right. Most people that are into lawns will freak out if their lawn looks like this, but um, it can fully, fully recover. This is part of um, the beauty of them. So your cool season grasses will naturally go dormant in hot weather and your warm season grasses will naturally go dormant in cooler weather. Um, you know, interestingly, bluegrass, cool season grass, super common. We think of it as kind of a, a thirsty, a high water use grass. And, but actually on the flip side, it's quite drought tolerant. It just goes dormant. I mean, it can really survive quite a bit of drought. Um, it's just that it takes a lot of water to keep it from going dormant in that hot weather. Um, other questions we get, when do I water? So for efficiency's sake, the best time is between 9 p.m. and 9 a.m. And this of course is just related to um, all those various pieces that affect the evapotranspiration rate. So you're gonna be wasting less water um, in the cooler weather and the lower winds of the night um, and therefore kind of getting more bang for your buck. Um, also, this time overlaps with the natural dew period. And so this is kind of interesting. Um, most turf diseases are gonna occur when the blades are wet for more than um, 14 consecutive hours. So we've already got that wetness for, you know, as many straight hours as um, the night is long. And so if we then water during the day, we're getting that grass wet again, and that is going to extend um, the period of time when the grass is wet. So especially if you go, you know, right before dew um, or right after dew in dawn or dusk, you're gonna be just extending that time that your grass is wet. Really for efficiency, um, the best time to water your grass is like the middle of the night. Um, and the only caution with that is that if you're always watering at like 2 a.m., you might not know if you have, um, you know, a damaged irrigation head. And we'll go over that stuff in a bit, but that's super important. So um, unless you're out there in the middle of the night with the flashlight, you'll want to kind of manually run those and double check them from time to time. Oops. How much do I water? So this one's gonna get um, a little wonky. And so again, it's gonna depend on various factors. I'll point out a couple of things. I really like these um, graphics. So first thing to notice when we talk about inches, inches is going to be the water you apply with your irrigation plus any rainfall. So naturally you want to reduce um, what you apply if there's rainfall. You can see here, and this is for a cool season, probably like your average Kentucky bluegrass lawn. Um, it's of course going to go up. Your water needs are gonna go up in the midsummer and then um, back down. And so the other thing we wanna look at over here is what a difference um, taking those inches and estimating what time we want to see, um, which I think is, is helpful because some people have a little trouble thinking in inches. We can do a pretty good estimate here and I'll show you how to um, get an even more accurate measure of the inches you're putting out in a bit, but it makes a huge difference what kind of sprinkler head you have. Um, so your spray heads, we have, for example, for July, one and a half inches, two cycles of nine minutes for your rotors, which put out less water at a time, which can be a good thing um, for us. Um, we're talking more than double the amount of runtime. So very difficult if someone kind of calls us at the office and say, well, how, how long should I run my sprinklers? You know, we have no clue until we have a lot more details. 
So you always want to think about um, all of those season, type of grass, type of sprinkler head. And just in case anyone does not know what type of sprinkler head you have, you may be looking at it, but say, I don't know what that's called. Um, so in the bottom left, spray head. So these are um, stationary, so they don't move from side to side. Typically they're set at a 180 degrees, so just going forward. Um, sometimes they can, the, um, the angle can be adjusted, but they don't move from side to side as they water. Um, in the bottom right, we have um, rotor. And so remember, these were the two we see here. So spray head putting out the most water at a time and rotor putting out less. And the rotor you can see in the top here has various um, ways you can adjust it. So it's gonna put out a little bit of water at a time, gonna move side to side as it goes. And you know, another thing I think people should um, don't often think about is <clears throat> when you're trying to determine how many inches am I putting out um, you know, in a given place in my lawn, if you've got that rotor that moves going over a really wide area for 10 minutes, each part of that area is gonna get less water than if it's going over um, a smaller area for the same amount of time. And then top right um, is stream rotors. And so these are on the opposite end of the spectrum of the sprays. These are the most efficient um, for us in Colorado, especially because they put out um, very small amounts of water. Um, and so you keep them on longer. So um, good idea again to water at times when you don't have a lot of um, high temperatures and evaporation, but it really helps avoid um, runoff and puddling because the water has time to soak into um, the soil. So frequency, this is one that we can have a pretty solid answer, even though the, um, you know, the details might look a little different. The rule of thumb is to water as deeply and as infrequently as you can. And this, again, you can imagine like, what are my limits? You, it's kind of on you to do a little investigating and I'll show you how. Um, but the idea here is that it's going to encourage the roots to go deeper down into the soil profile. So I know I've watered very deeply. Um, and then in the days after I've watered, um, if that lawn were to get just a little bit of water whenever it needed it, it they, the roots don't care to grow down because they don't have to. So you make sure you have plenty of water, but then you make the roots work for it. And once you've got these nice established roots, it actually will lead the lawn to be more drought tolerant um, and pest resistant overall because it's got that really nice um, foundation with the roots. And so when we say water as deeply as infrequently as possible, what you'll want to do is to take your inches per week. So let's say around this time of year, one and a half inches. Um, typically we'd say usually you're around one inches per week or one inch per week in June, but with this hot weather, you're probably bumping it up to about an inch and a half. So you know that's what you need total. And then um, you're going to see how few um, watering days you can get away with basically. And so one thing, one method that's really good for this to be able to water deeply because we have these clay soils and a lot of times if um, we turn on the irrigation for too long, we start to see like in this photo runoff into the sidewalk and or the street. And part of that runoff can be, you know, you want to definitely check that your heads are facing the right way and in good working order. But when we see runoff, a lot of times it's, it's, not, it's not that the grass has just had enough water. It's just that the water um, has not had time to um, soak into the soil before. So what you can do is what we call the um, uh, cycle and soak or cycle in your irrigation. So 
still focusing on one day, but I'll run a station for, let's say I want to do 30 minutes overall. So I'll run a station for five to 10 minutes, then stop, and then run it again five to 10 minutes, then stop, then run again five to 10 minutes. And that's still my one irrigation day, um, but it will allow that water to soak in um, really deeply. Because if you just turn the water off when you start to see runoff, you're actually not going to get that um, deep soak through the soil profile and not going to encourage that root growth. So a little more on the various things that could change up what the exact answer is for you. Um, soil texture, we do tend to have clayey soil, which um, drains very slowly here in Colorado, but it's not 100%. Um, so your sandy soil, for example, that's going to drain quickly. Um, so you would need to um, water more frequently and more lightly. Um, your exposure, so obviously a, a north or a shady uh, spot in your lawn might need less water than a southern exposure. Um, heat and wind, we talked about slope is another big one, and this um, is another place where that cycle and soak method is helpful because it can be really tough to avoid the runoff on a slope. Um, and then mowing, we'll talk about that in a sec, but you know, the mowing can, in a sense, if you have um, a larger plant, right, that's gonna require more water, but also mowing to a high enough height can actually shade out the ground, which helps with um, reducing that rate of the evaporation like we talked about. But no matter what, no matter how honed in you've got it, bare minimum, you, you're going to have to adjust seasonally. So keep that in mind. Um, you know, for a healthy lawn that's also water efficient, there's really not a set it and forget it all season um, type of option. There are some great automated, you know, rain sensors and stuff like that. So that does help, but it's going to require a little bit of adjustment. So some examples of what too much water looks like, squishy turf, that's a big one. You'll see shallow roots. Again, those shallow roots mean poor drought resistance. We haven't made those roots do any work. So the minute they have to do some work, you know, they're just gonna um, flop over and say, go dormant. Um, you'll need more fertilization. If you have too much water, you'll have more soil compaction and, um, your form thatch more quickly, which I will talk about shortly. Um, you may have more weeds, um, certain bugs like it more, and of course, you'll have higher water bills. So um, if you want help honing in on all these various pieces we've talked about, there are a few um, great ways to do it. So an irrigation check, you're, it's gonna evaluate the, the system, um, the design, any type of maintenance issues. And also um, they can help you look at your management practices. So it's pretty comprehensive. And um, th this is a program for uh, free irrigation checks. It's through Resource Central. Um, Broomfield does partner with them. And you can find information on this service at um, broomfield.org slash save water or directly with Resource Central, but super great service and um, super helpful. A lot, of, a lot of waste can happen when we don't have our sprinklers honed in well. And you can do a good bit of work on this yourself too. So catch can test, there are a handful of different methods for this, some that can give you really precise answers um, and others that, like this one I've outlined here, that can give you um, Still some good information. So if you wanted to take it really um, intensive, get equipment, you could see up here in the top right, we've got a funnel that leads into a beaker. You're staking the beaker into the ground and you're measuring. That's great. Um, if you want to go the DIY option, um, and those supplies are, you know, available to your average consumer, but you can use any flat bottoms can. You want it to have straight sides, so you don't want to, um, it to um, slope out as it as it uh, goes vertical. You want to make sure that whatever cans you use, they're all the same 
thighs. Anything with straight sides, flat bottoms, as long as they're all the same will do. So this is a cool trick to figure out, again, like what does how many inches per week mean and how do I practice that in my lawn? So to figure out your inches, you can place six cans randomly around um, a zone. Then you turn on the sprinkler for 10 minutes, pour all the water into the can, and then you measure the depth. So this is the precipitation in inches. So the idea here is six cans times 10 minutes, 60 minutes. So that'll give you your inches per hour for that zone. Um, and you can adjust accordingly depending on that. And, you know, to take a look at what a difference this makes, um, thinking about, again, what's an inch. So 10th of an inch here, we see a difference and look what a difference it makes in um, the condition of the grass. So definitely a big deal to get some accuracy there. And you just can't really evaluate um, an irrigation system coverage just by watching the sprinklers. Like you might say, oh, well, this one's reaching that edge and this one's reaching that edge, so I'm in good shape. But we can see here, um, certain areas, even though they're closer to the sprinkler head, are not getting as much water. Um, other things you can do yourself and that you should do, you know, at least at the beginning of the season, but fairly regularly, they're easy to do. Each head you have, you want to um, check the delivery angle of the water and adjust it. Um, you want to make sure that the, the head itself pops up straight up. It's not tilted. Um, make sure that the nozzle is releasing water above grass height. So whatever that is, if the nozzle is lower than the grass, <clears throat> it's going to get obviously stopped from shooting out as far as it should. Worn heads and leaking valves obviously you want to replace. All right, so our another kind of big preventing problems practice is lawn mowing. Some people love it, some people hate it. I kind of like it. Um, one more maintenance actually plays a big part in this. So checking the air filters, clean them and replace them as needed, sharpening the blades, and you can just follow manufacturer recommendations for this. Some grasses tend to do this um, tearing at the tip, some of your fescues, for example, more than others. Um, but with any grass, a nice sharp blade will uh, make all the difference your like professional lawn care or your professional mowers, for example, just to give you an idea, they are, they'll have sharpened blades every day. Um, that's how big a difference it makes for you, your average consumer, um, definitely once a season, if you wanna do it more, all the better. Um, grass height makes a big difference here. So the optimum um, blade or grass height is two and a half to three inches minimum two inches. So um, this is not your crew cut type look. Um, if you don't mind the look of three inches, it's kind of the taller, the better. Um, when you have less than two inches, it's going to reduce the drought tolerance, um, which is gonna generally stress the plant and um, can contribute also directly to insect disease and weed problems. Um, when you have this nice lush, connected um, layer of grass. Again, it's gonna act as kind of like a living mulch. It's gonna shade out weeds. It's going to um, slow down evaporation of water from the soil. So it is um, really helpful to keep your grass as high as you can kind of stand it aesthetically. Um, taking a look here at um, your at the bottom, your um, clipped and not clipped, so like mode or not mode um, grasses, you can see that the more mass that we have up top, that's the more photosynthesizing parts of the plant, which you know is how the plant grows, the more roots we have down bottom. So that is one of the other pieces that contributes to this relationship. Um, you know, another bonus is you just, if you have a higher grass height that you're shooting for, you have to mow less frequently. Um, and it also helps with 
um, products soaking in water and also fertilizer. So it's gonna help prevent uh, leaching. And the other piece, even though we do have a desired height, which is two and a half to three inches, you do wanna mow frequently enough so that no more than a third of the grass is removed at a time. And this just goes to kind of, you don't want to um, stress out the plant too much. Like if you think of pruning a tree, right? You don't wanna prune off 60% of the branches, right? That's gonna go too far and stress the tree. So same thing here. So if for some reason you've let your grass grow really high and um, to get it down to three inches, you'd be taking off more than a third. What you can do is just mow um, a third of the current height, then just wait a few days and then kind of keep going down stepwise, never taking off more than a third until you get to your desired height. <clears throat> Obviously for your cool season grasses, your blue grasses, the um, spring, which also tends to be the wet time, is gonna need more frequent mowing um, to make sure you never let it get high enough where you're cutting down way more than a third. Um, and leaving clippings on the lawn is a great idea. Um, they break down quickly. I think a lot of people worry about it causing thatch or, and it doesn't. Um, <clears throat> it is a good idea to use a mulching mower in this case. It'll chop it up a little more finely, um, but it can be super beneficial and uh, for low maintenance or organic or low input lawn care it is one of the best things you can do. I mean, depending on yeah, how high maintenance you want your lawn to be, leaving lawn clippings on the lawn can, you know, replace the need for uh, fertilizer. So totally makes a big difference. <clears throat> so thatch, we kind of touched on this before. So it's a problem. It can happen anywhere. It tends to be a problem with bluegrass. Um, from an aesthetic perspective, it will look like brown spots and kind of general thinning of the lawn. What it is, is this layer, you can see in the photo here, of <clears throat> organic matter kind of between the leaf zone and the soil. So it's above ground. And a lot of times actually what happens is, and this is another reason to water deeply, um, when you have like lazy lawn roots that just don't have to go ever really much below the surface to get their water, Sometimes they'll just pop up above ground and that, then they die and that turns into thatch. Um, so it's dead grass, stems, and um, roots. And there are various ways to control thatch, but you don't really need to worry about it unless it's more than a half inch thick. Um, aeration, which we'll go over in a sec, is one of the better controls. You wanna aerate at least in the fall, but if you're having a thatch problem, um, or you know you have compacted soil, then aerating in the spring and the fall um, is a good idea. And again, to be clear, the grass clippings don't contribute um, to thatch. And what does contribute to thatch is um, sodding over compacted soil, for example. Um, soil compaction, same type of deal, but um, typically when we have dead, um, when we have organic matter, microbes in part are helping break that down and it's not gonna form that thick mat or thatch. But when we have soil compaction, we have slower microbe activity. Um, <clears throat> similarly, when we over fertilize our lawns, that lawn is going to outpace the microbial activity that will break down the um, organic matter and then it will form thatch. Grass species, like I said, um, Kentucky blue tent is just more prone to thatch and that's life. Um, frequent heavy irrigation. If you have waterlogged um, soil, then you, many of the beneficial microorganisms cannot live in that. And pesticides potentially, depending on what they are, can um, again, slow that microbial activity. So a little more on aeration or core cultivation. So you can see in the photo a really nice image of what it should look like. You're actually taking these, what we call plugs out. So this helps reduce soil compaction or kind of like fight the fight back at it. 
Um, it helps control thatch, as I said, and it helps water and fertilizer move around, move into the root zone. Um, one of the pieces with our clay soils is that um, because there's very small pore spaces within the soil, it's tough for anything to um, move around in there. So when we aerate, we make larger um, spaces in the soil. And a good soil is gonna have some really large pore spaces, some really small ones, and the whole spectrum. So that's the idea with aer aeration or core cultivation. You can technically aerate anytime the ground isn't frozen. You don't wanna do it when it's too hot and dry. So, um, and the reason is that you take out that kind of chunk of grass and then you're exposing around that area all this um, bare soil, which can dry out more quickly. So avoid it when it's hot and dry. If you had a need to aerate right now, for example, in this weather, you'd wanna just spot aerate rather than aerating your whole lawn right now is not an ideal time to do that because of the temperature. And that is one of the reasons why we typically say spring and fall are, are the best times. Um, you can rent these tools, you can hire someone, um, you can do it you know, by hand, but it's actually, I think, a little more difficult than people think. I'll show you what you wanna shoot for in a sec. Um, but either way, you wanna make sure you do mark your sprinkler heads and uh, cables before aerating. Make sure you don't um, stab anything below ground. So, <clears throat> it's important to pull a plug. So we see here in the top right, that's a good example. Bottom right, not so much. Um, so we don't just wanna poke a hole. It'll make your life a lot easier if you water the lawn mm, two days or so before aerating. <clears throat> and this is what I think some people um, miss out on when, like this is the main disadvantage I can think of of when people want to aerate by hand is that the to be effective those holes should be pretty dang close together two to three inches apart um, and two to three inches deep so it can be pretty um, tough to do by hand and it's good to just let those plugs fall apart um, in the lawn leave them there if the lawn has a thatch layer um, you can collect them if there's not a thatch layer but you don't have to And so check this out. So obviously this was the, we've cut like a transect of <clears throat> an area and then we can see where the plug was. I mean, look at how those roots are able to penetrate so much deeper. So um, makes a huge difference in that deep rooting, which, you know, as I keep harping on is like one of the most important things we can do for our lawns in Colorado. And, when you make holes, it's a great time to overseed or fertilize. You can just spread right there, spread a little compost or whatever over them, um, and just do the two, uh, two tasks in one. <clears throat> Fertilization. This is another one of our very basic practices. Um, all of your fertilizer bags for whether lawn or other are going to have the three numbers, um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And your numbers are going to be percentages. So in this case, we have an eight pound bag and 20% of that eight pounds is nitrogen. 10% of that eight pounds is phosphate. 5% is um, potassium. If you have different numbers in the same ratio, so let's say we had 40, 20, 40, those have the same percentages. And so <clears throat> you would just apply those at different rates, but you'd get, if doing that, get similar results. Um, really the biggest nutrient for Colorado lawns is the nitrogen. Um, we tend to have pretty adequate um, phosphorus and potassium for lawns in our soils, but it's, you know, it's just a bonus if you also have those other two, but kind of the biggest um, need for success for fertilizing here for lawns is that nitrogen. So the big thing here, because our <clears throat> different products have different, you know, percentages, always just follow the instructions for both your fertilizer and your spreader itself. 
And if you're not quite sure of either of those, which you should be using, go with the lower rate. Um, and using a slow release fertilizer is ideal for lawns. So when to fertilize? What I would call high maintenance, just meaning I, I want, I want my lawn green. I want it green year round. I want it, you know, I'm a lawn person. If, if I were a lawn person, um, spring, summer, mid fall. Um, is a good time to do it. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, if you're only fertilizing once a year, the fall is actually the best time to do it. So <clears throat> what it does, especially for our cool season grasses, um, so in the fall, number one, our cool season grasses are um, happier, they're growing more actively, versus in the summer, if they're hot and drought stress and I'm barely keeping up with the water they need to kind of maintain and not go dormant, I don't want to fertilize and encourage them to grow faster where it's just going to need more water. Um, the other piece is that if you're fertilizing in the fall, that's when the grasses are developing their roots, um, which is what's going to take them through the winter and contribute to winter survival. So if you're only doing one, do the fall. Um, this photo here is an example of um, what zero, two, and four fertilizer apps looks like over the course of a season. So keep in mind here, this is Wisconsin. Um, they've got more moisture. They might need more fertilizer. But what I'd like to point out here is there's the difference in weeds to the dandelions. And so really some, some amount of nitrogen fertilization, and it could, again, just be your lawn clippings, really is pretty important to um, the health of your lawn. And when you have a healthy lawn, it goes so far in just out competing those weeds, right? You don't have any just bare spots for them to grow into. All right, so those are the big pieces of maintenance. Now we're gonna look at common problems. And again, you'll see that those practices um, have a big part in how we experience or don't experience these problems throughout the season. So weeds, of course, big one. Kind of painting with a broad brush, causes of weed issues, um, seed bank. So many seeds can live for a very long time dormant um, in the environment or, or on top of or beneath the soil. And if there's a soil disturbance, that's gonna signal them to all of a sudden have their um, moment of glory and grow. And they might've been dormant there for you know 10 years. Um, if you've got tough perennials, we have many, I'll talk about bindweed in a second. Um, you know, those both have really persistent seeds and um, are just really um, aggressive spreaders through other means as well. And so if you have a lawn where weeds like that, were not um, dealt with before planting the lawn, it's going to kind of just be a persistent issue, which is a little bit of a bummer. The cultural practices we've talked about, so the thicker and healthier the grass you have, the less easy it is for weed seeds to germinate and for weeds to compete with the grass. The wrong species or cultivar selection of the grass, this actually is getting at the exact same thing. If your grass isn't happy, it's easier for the weeds. Other pests, um, same thing. We don't want to um, have reduced health of our lawn. And something to look out for is, unfortunately, um, weed seeds might be um, included in some um, lawn seeds, or you could get weedy sod or weedy topsoil. So just um, buy from reputable sources, look for um, guarantees and certifications on um, that sort of thing. Just some examples, we've got our annual grasses. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but um, you, many of us might be familiar with goosegrass, barnyard or crabgrass, especially. Um, Poa annua is actually annual bluegrass. Um, but it's not a desirable weed. And that's kind of easy to tell. It obviously, it looks like bluegrass, but it's got this lime green color. 
um, which you can see pretty well in that picture there. We've got perennial grasses that we don't want in our lawns. Um, pictured here, tall fescue. Um, there are what we call turf type tall fescues that can actually make a fabulous lawn. Um, the weedy ones tend to be more like mound forming like we see in that picture. And just generally, if you don't, you know, if you have a lawn that is something besides tall fescue, you don't want tall fescue going there. Um, we've got um, bent grass in the top right, red top in the bottom, and not picture some other ones you might see or hear about, quack grass, brome grass, goitia, which in some places is a lawn grass. Um, same with Bermuda. And then uh, Poa trivialis is another type of bluegrass that we don't want. That's rough bluegrass. So to control um, weedy grasses, back to the maintenance. Mowing as high as you can stand. Um, irrigating properly, which we now know is um, deeper, less frequently. Weeds, really it's a pretty broad statement that applies pretty broadly tend to do well with that light, frequent irrigation. Um, they don't have the established roots, so that's something we can do to help our lawns outcompete them. And the fertilizing and aerating at least once a year, this again is just um, giving your lawn the best chances. And you can use pre-emergence herbicides um, before the weeds emerge. So it depends on the weed for the timing, that's important. Um, very broad window, front range, let's say mid-April to mid-May. Broad leaf weeds, so this is anything um, that is not a grass. Also very common um, and have a lot of the similar controls um, as the weedy grasses do, but we do have some other options for these um, specifically because since they're not grasses, there are, are options of herbicides that will not affect grasses and will only affect broadleaf weeds. So some people opt for that as well. I want to specifically touch on bindweed because we get um, questions about this a lot. So adequate nitrogen um, and the proper irrigation. This is big in a um, in an unirrigated you know field, for example, it's it's hard to beat um, bindweed. It's just so tough. Um, but if you are giving your grass uh, good conditions um, and over time keeping at the bindweed control, it honest, I know for a lot of people, um, it's one of those things that feels like hopeless, but it honestly does over time um, pulling, even mowing the bindweed um, and if using herbicides if you choose, which even those you know, bindweed is one of those that it's often not dealt with in one go. Over time, that's the best strategy for bindweed is um, just reducing that overall energy store that it has. Another big one is not letting those flowers set seed because again, bindweed kind of gets us in from two directions. It has very persistent seeds and it spreads very aggressively from the live plants. Um, Looking at the big picture for managing weeds. So um, our first and foremost, we wanna prevent with our healthy turf. And then we do have pre-emergent herb herbicides, which we can use for um, our grassy weeds or and or um, our broadleaf weeds or post-emergent herbicides, which are um, really only an option for the broadleaf weeds unless you want to also kill your lawn. So again, the timing of the pre-emergent herbicides will depend on the product and the, um, and the weeds that it is aimed at. But the idea is that you always want it to be before seed germination. You water it in well, um, and that is how that works. And you don't want to use that if you're um, going to be overseeding soon because it will also um, disrupt the overseeding of your um, lawn. So more common problems, compacted soil. And again, this is just something that our clay soils tend to get, um, but we can look at the causes and um, try to avoid those. 
So traffic, you know, just being walked on and that's life. And for some people, that's what the lawn is for. And if that's the case, don't feel like you can't walk on your lawn. Um, just take the other steps with, you know, the aeration, um, the nice deep watering to help your lawn recover, um, making sure you have a nice high traffic uh, species. Rainfall can contribute to um, soil compaction and um, pet traffic as well. So the aeration is really the best thing we can do for soil compaction. Um, over time too, if you choose to add a little bit of um, a nice organic matter, a compost, just kind of a sprinkle around those holes when you aerate, that will over time, pretty slowly, but um, you know, help improve that soil texture too. And again, if your lawn is for being, you know, run and jump and walked on, then great. But if it's not really, you could always um, think about having pathways like this nice flagstone one shown here. And if those are kind of the travel ways, then um, the lawn's getting a little less of that. So other common problems, um, Ascochyta leaf blight. We get this one a lot, lot, lot. And we're actually haven't started getting it yet this season, but I anticipate it will we'll start getting these questions like tomorrow. Um, it is something that we see affects all, you know, can affect the various um, lawn species we have here. It's a stress induced disease. Um, and the conditions for it are not super well understood, but it, you see here, it says most common when spring turns to summer um, and or when we have very wet weather followed by very dry, hot weather. So, I mean, if you think about the weather patterns we have had the last few weeks, I suspect this is gonna be a pretty bad Ascochyta season. Um, so you will see it where, it, it is a form of drought stress. So you will see it where your irrigation coverage is, coverage is not as good. Um, and so a little counterintuitive here. So in general, we want to water as infrequently as possible, um, you can kind of overwater the Ascochyta areas to, to have it um, recover. But the big takeaway here is that even though this looks really horrible, it's not lethal at all. Um, so it's called leaf blight, meaning it only affects the leaf and the crowns, which again is the most important part. The crowns are not affected at all. So even though it, it happens so suddenly, and it looks, you know, so yellow, it freaks people out. But um, really, if you are, have a fine watering schedule, if you want to kind of way increase it, you might see the um, symptoms go away earlier. But really, if you just <clears throat> keep at your regular schedule, the symptoms do tend to disappear on their own within a few weeks. Um, this is a fungus, but fungicides are not recommended um, because they are, there are many different species of Ascochyta. The fungicides can be difficult to apply. They can be kind of specific. And the timing of the application is usually very important. And Ascochyta, it just comes up so suddenly and often unpredictably. So for that reason, the fungicides are just not really a realistic um, treatment for them. So here on the left, see another example that just that swath of straw color um, and otherwise healthy grass that can be Ascochyta. And on the right, if you kind of get down and um, you can see down in the grass, you can see um, this pretty distinctive look of an Ascochyta affected leaf. So it's those bleached tips. And that's what our eye sees like on the big scale, we see that straw color. And then there's this um, darker, what we call banding. That's pretty distinctive. And then down low, it's actually still green. Another fungus, necrotic ring spot. So this is one that really only affects um, Kentucky bluegrass. So one of the options here is to simply have a different grass. Um, it has also a really distinctive look. It's what we call um, donut or frog eyes. So it's a circle. Um, of dead grass with green in the middle. 
Um, and symptoms develop in late summer. And this one is interesting. It is basically, it's a root rot type of fungus. So, um, and the damage kind of tends to happen earlier. Overwatering um, contributes to this. And then we don't know until the summer when um, the grass is trying to take up water and um, those roots have rotted. And even though the lawn is getting sufficient water, it can't, the roots can't do their job. Um, so this again, treatment, I mean, resistant grasses, perennial ryegrass is a great one. Um, good turf management, so not overwatering. Um, there are fungicides that work for necrotic ring spot. Um, you can overseed diseased patches. So since it's a root rot, it's not going to, um, your new seedlings will be fine. Another fungal disease, fairy ring. So um, not as common, caused by um, various types of fungus. Um, there are three kind of big buckets we see here or types. So type one is in the top and that causes these arcs of dead turf. Type two is the second photo down um, and that causes these dark green um, arcs or rings, and those will get larger and larger. And then type three is where you see the actual above ground mushrooms, often after a rain. Um, fungicides don't typically uh, get rid of fairy rings. Spring and fall aeration is good for this. Um, but the fungicide will, may seem to work for a bit and then it turns out um, they have not fully controlled it. Gray snow mold. So this we see during um, or after and during periods of prolonged snow cover. So I mentioned this before, um, particularly where you have um, a mat of leaves or other debris on the lawns. Again, if your leaves or your grass clipping are mulched up, and left on the lawn, not gonna cause this. Um, but this is pretty basic. It actually doesn't do, you know, lasting damage. You don't need to control it with chemicals. And the various pieces you can do to control it are just to promote that circulation. So raking, aerating, um, you can overseed if you choose to. And um, a little bit, we caution to over fertilize in the spring. Um, but a little jump start in the spring can help um, kind of dry out that area before the, um, by the rapid growth. And so you'll tend to see this obviously in like north or shady areas because again, they remain with snow cover longer. Mites. So we've got quite a few types of mites and these guys will start to see the damage in the spring. Um, early spring, um, and it's usually related to dry conditions, and um, you really can just water to um, reduce the symptoms. It's actually not a huge deal. Um, winter watering of our lawns is very important for mite control, and one of the best things we can do. So a couple ways to kind of identify the mites. So in excuse me, this left picture here, we've got um, banks grass mite damage, um, kind of large swaths in this right picture here, clover mites. Um, and again, thinking about the fact that they are attracted to these super dry, warm um, conditions, if you have grass by a south facing wall, that's gonna dry out quicker, that's gonna get warmer, that's gonna attract mites. Um, so here, a lot of times on lining structures or, or buildings or structures of any kind, um, mites are something to look for. And you can, you might need a hand lens, but I mean, they are visible. So, you know, the diagnosis is to visually confirm them. Sod webworm. So, this is a little bit of a um, kind of a category of larvae of various insects. So pretty common. Um, they usually don't create a big problem. So these are like 
caterpillar or grub looking things. Um, so these are kind of chewing at roots um, a little bit under the ground. Um, if you notice lots of birds feeding in your lawn, kind of like, you know, sticking their beaks in the lawn and you haven't sprinkled bird seed there, um, yes, it could be worms, but if you notice an increase in activity, they're probably going for these grub-like guys. Um, you can also see the adults, which look like these moths, um, <clears throat> flying around the lawn. And again, if you see lots of those with no kind of good reason for them to be there, it might be an indicator that you have the larvae underneath. Um, grub control insecticides will work pretty broadly on any of these types of, of um, pests. So most of them we see are damaged in spring, summer, that's when the larvae are emerging and kind of nibbling at stuff. And then later you'll see the um, adults. But there is one, um, cranberry girdler, which we start to see same idea, but they tend to cause their damage in the fall. And we've been seeing a little more of this um, lately when we have, you know, a lawn that seems like it's been doing well all season and, and then we have these issues. And so this is pretty easy to confirm too. You'll have really shallow um, roots and eventually you'll see, you know, um, death of the grass on top. But if you just kind of peel away, you know, a little bit of the sod, you can see these scrubs easily with the naked eye, um, you know, no more than an inch down. So easy to confirm whether that's what you got going on. Rabbit damage. So this is just, <laughs> this is unfortunately not one we can do much about. Um, but it is actually a really common one that I get asked about um, because it, I can understand how it could look like something, you know, more, more serious. I mean, they can do quite a bit of damage, but the, the telltale signs, other than, of course, you know, the rabbit themselves or scat, the look of the damage has a couple, um, couple key features. So they're nibbling the grass. So they're nibbling it really, really low to the ground. Um, so you're not seeing like death of the high grass. You're seeing like the grass is just gone except for right by the ground. And then also um, these bright yellow spots are caused by their urine. So their urine is very concentrated um, and can cause this kind of burn of the grass. So again, with those, not much you could do theoretically. Um, you know, keeping them out of the area, but I don't think that is realistic for many of us because um, they're everywhere, but it's still good to be able to identify what it looks like because we don't want to think that this is a different pest or disease and start, you know, um, treating for something we don't have. And again, the really the best thing we can do is promote healthy grass that's going to recover from this uh, more easily. <clears throat> So to kind of sum it all up here, um, most lawn problems result directly or indirectly from poor lawn management. So the big, big things we want to remember, mowing, we don't want to do, uh, we don't want to mow too short. We want to mow often enough that we're not stressing out the lawn each time we mow because we're cutting off half the grass. Fertilizer. Um, wrong time, meaning I don't want to fertilize my cool season grass in the middle of the summer when it's already struggling. Um, you know, too little, our grass might not um, outcompete some of our weeds, for example, or too, too much um, can lead to certain diseases like necrotic green spot. Irrigation, of course, too much, too little, both not great or mechanical issues with our irrigation equipment that leads to poor coverage. Um, thatch makes lawn care more difficult and is not appealing visually. Um, compaction goes back to those roots um, and the roots are just the foundation of, of the health of our grass. And then pests, sure, there are many with many different um, specific kind of causes and symptoms, but all in all, healthy turf is going to be fewer weeds, disease, insect problems, minimizing your um, chemical inputs, and just helping that grass um, recover if you do have issues. 
And um, thinking about, do you have a grass that's well suited to your, uh, your needs, your use patterns in your lawn? So keep all this in mind. Um, I will check out the questions if I can find my video. All right. Let's see, we got a few here. What time of day should we water? We have mushrooms. Okay, so um, yeah, mushrooms pretty common and I should have distinguished the fairy rings I mentioned, there are many, many mushrooms you will see in your lawn that are not that, and that are totally normal and fine. Um, really, yeah, almost all of them. And those can be just, you know, they're decomposers, so they can be um, not only related to water, but related to um, having kind of dead material around to feed on, so like a um, tree stump or even just like a fallen branch, whatever. Um, but time of day still um, is going to be best um, before 9 a.m. or after 9 p.m. Um, definitely not ever between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Most places actually have rules um, for water, efficient water use that dictate that. Um, but actually for the mushrooms, you know, watering at night, you're gonna overlap with that dew time. So you will have, um, you, the grass won't be wet, the blades as long. Um, so yeah, basically the earlier in the morning or the later in the evening, the better. Next question, during months where more than one cycle of watering is recommended, how should the cycles be timed relative to one another? So one hour between start times, two hours. Okay, gotcha. So I, I believe this is referring to that cycle method. Um, so basically as soon as you, the answer will be when the water has had a chance to soak in, right? But um, it doesn't have to be hours or anything. It can typically be, you know, half an hour max. But if you have multiple zones, let's say, that run your morning irrigation is one after the other, um, typically timing for that, it's fine to say, all right, I'm gonna go zone one, two, three at half time and then right back to zone one, two, three, right after that, for that cycle, that's typically enough. Um, hopefully that answers the question. What fertilizer number is optimum for Broomfield lawns? Um, so there really isn't, unfortunately, a number I can give you because those numbers are um, just percentages. So you could have, um, very similar results that you get, um, you know, very different numbers that have the same ratios for that NPK. Um, but I would say higher in uh, nitrogen and some, um, so that first, that N, some of the second and third number um, are all fine. But again, nitrogen is that, mo is that most important. And as long as you're following the um, instructions on the label uh, with the fertilizer, it's really just to fertilize at all is better than not doing it at all. And, um, you know, between there and burning your grass with over fertilizing, it, you actually have a lot of leeway. <clears throat> you mentioned watering in the AM hours. I heard the lawn needs to rest. So, is, <clears throat> excuse me, is there a rest period for the lawn? So, I'm not sure that I know what you mean by the rest period. I'm wondering if you are thinking about what I mentioned about where we don't want the grass itself, like above ground. We don't want that to be wet for a really long time. Um, and so it's already going to be wet from the dew. So 
what I was referring to was to water early enough or late enough where you are actually overlapping the dew. So you're not extending <clears throat> that overall time. So yes, it would not be ideal for that reason to you know, start your irrigation right after that dew is just, just at the end of, of drying up. All right, so, so far I have gotten through our Zoom questions. I'm gonna check out Facebook and folks on Zoom if you have more questions, absolutely, feel free. Let's see what we got here. All right, I'm not seeing anything on Facebook. Um, my contact information, again, was on <clears throat> the first slide. Anyone's welcome to reach out if any questions come up um, later. We also have a Master Gardener helpline at the CSU Extension office that you can reach out to anytime. Um, so yeah, appreciate everyone being here. Thanks for the great questions. And um, hope everyone has a lovely evening. <laughs>